<laughs> uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Vera again. Uh, Vera Matrice is at the University of Perugia in Italy and will be telling us about fixed point realism, Hubble trouble, and the hypothesis of early dark energy. Thank you, Helen. Thank you for coming. And uh, yes, yeah, so there are lots of stuff in the title, but actually what I would like to talk about today is about this thing that the way in which a science makes a progresses and so progresses are through like, you know, by choosing which hypothesis to test and, uh, you know, how to move forward when you know, there are little crises or tension, okay, very much hinges upon our metaphysical positions about measurement results, okay? And our metaphysical positions about measurement results also hinges upon epistemic justifications. And so whether we are justified or not in being realist about measurement results, okay? And I would like to discuss about this within the context of the Hubble tension, also called a mini crisis, okay? And uh, well, we know that there are, very broadly speaking, two different kinds of measurements that can all pin down the value of the Hubble constant. So the Orley universe uh, kinds of measurements that are, are un indirect ways to constrain the value of the Hubble constant and the later universe measurements that are more direct, okay? And so they provide a more direct way to measure the Hubble constant, okay? So then if the lambda CDM is correct, then the two values should find agreement, but we know that they do not agree. Okay, so then how we should move forward? Well, there have been a plethora of different uh, options, different kinds of solutions, okay? Different ways to resolve the tension, okay? And so I would like to discuss in particular the early dark energy kinds of solution and see what kind of metaphysical position it has or it is implied within uh, this uh, solution about measurement results of the Hubble constant. So first of all, I will be talking a little bit about the Hubble controversy. Then I will be talking a little bit about the early dark energy uh, hypothesis. And then uh, we will go into more philosophical consideration on measurements. Okay? So the Hubble constant controversy, okay? So we know that the Hubble constant is the quantity that represents Okay, the special the, the rate of the spatial expansion of the universe, so the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. Okay, and then uh, determining its value is really important. Why is it so well? Because it allows us uh, to also get information about uh, the components of the universe, uh, the age of the universe, and what eventually the fate of the universe will be. Okay. We know that there are, very broadly speaking, as I said before, two um, approaches, okay, to find uh, the value of the Hubble, Hubble constant, okay? So let's uh, start with the early universe measurements, okay? So as I said, this is an indirect way to constrain the Hubble constant value, okay? from measurement of the cosmic microwave background radiation, okay? And assuming that the lambda CDM model is the true model, okay? So the best results that we have so far comes from the European Space Agency's Planck program, okay? That actually has set a value for the Hubble constant, which is 67.4 kilometers per sec per meter gas per sec. Okay, so an uncertainty of less than 1%, which is really great, okay? On the other hand, we have the programs, okay, measuring the Hubble constant, okay, by looking at local features of the universe, so such as the distance to some astronomical objects or like the brightness, their apparent luminosity, and so, so, so and the, uh, you know, this kind of uh, data, okay? And so these are data that we collect from the late universe, okay? And the strategy is to build a cosmic distance ladder, okay? Of intergalactic distances, okay? 
And then one can use this equation, okay, which relates the distance d to galaxies, okay, um, to their accession velocity v, um, relative to Earth, okay, and then calculate and get the age, okay. So the one of the most important programs, okay, there are many, but one of the most important program is a shoes, and uh, it's a program led by Reese, okay, that found the value of a 73.2 kilometers per sec per megaparsec. Okay, and the uncertainty here is almost a double, okay, with respect to the plan. So it's 1.8%, but still it's really good. Okay. So, how, how far out does local mean? The local galaxy group? Uh, yeah, so as far as I would say, like the supernova type 1A would be. So I would just uh, say, uh, let me check. I would just say, oh, maybe it's much more the local. Do you have an idea like the limit of the local? Yeah, I would say probably this, but maybe it's a little bit farther. Okay. I have never found like the precise. Yeah. 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 Thank you for the question. Yeah. It's actually something that I never asked myself. <laughs> yes. So actually building the cosmic distance ladder, okay, involves uh, different uh, sorts of techniques, okay, because we have uh, to build up, okay, different ranks, okay, that, uh, and then each one depends up on the previous one, okay, for calibration, okay. So normally, for small distances, we use a geometrical techniques, and for further distances, we use the standard candles, okay, that are astronomical objects of which we know their intrinsic brightness, okay? And so if then we actually know the apparent bright brightness, okay, and we know the intrinsic brightness, then we can calculate the distance, okay? So for the shoes program, okay, there are three kinds of uh, steps, okay, in building this uh, cosmic distance ladder, okay? So for small distances, we use the parallax, okay? For intermediate distances, they use the C field variables, okay? That we know that they brighten and dim periodically, okay? According to Levitt's law, okay? And the Levitt's law, we know that relates to the position period of a star, with its intrinsic brightness in such a way that the longer the period, the brighter the star is, okay? And then for larger distances, we the Schuster program uses the type of 1A supernovae, okay? Well, we know, we should know the intrinsic brightness of the type 1A supernova um, at the peak level, okay? So then uh, the Hubble trouble, is that we get a discordance of the results, okay, between the early uh, universe measurements and the late universe measurements, okay? So why? What is the problem? What is the reason for this discordance, okay? So one option would be the failure of the lambda CD model itself. Why is it so? Well, because it predicts that uh, both the values should agree, okay? And at the very like, first sight, okay, it really looks like. So as the Reese said, okay, well, one of the ability of the Lambda CDM model is really, okay, to connect to ends of cosmic time, okay? And if it cannot, if there, there is not this connection, then this uh, should, it might be regarded clearly as a sign of the breakdown of the Lambda CDN model, okay? Yesterday, we saw like many kind of reasons for which we could be anti-realist of the Lambda CDN model, okay? However, we do not really have an immediate solution, okay? And we do not know exactly what this crisis, okay, 
um, is leading us. What is exactly the problem of the Lambda CDM model? Okay, it's not that by saying, well, there is this discord and so the Lambda CDM model is wrong, then we know what to do next, what to fix next. Okay, and what is the alternative of the Lambda CDM model that we should go for? Okay. Also, yesterday we were actually discussing the question, well, I mean, are we really sure that we want to be anti-realist of the Lambda CDM model? Okay, wouldn't this maybe lead to also have a kind of like anti-realist attitude towards like scientific cosmology, which is really problematic and we don't want that, okay? A second hypothesis would be to target the set of auxiliary hypotheses of the Lambda CDM model. And so say, well, look, the main theoretical framework is fine. We're not targeting the main general theoretical framework of Lambda CDM model, but we should work more on the auxiliary hypothesis, okay? Well, we know that when a piece of negative evidence is gathered, okay, then it could be the sign, okay, that maybe we have to add a new auxiliary hypothesis, okay, for instance. Well, let's be careful here. Since the Lambda CDM model fits the majority of observation, including all the ones of, you know, the late universe and so on and so forth, okay, then we don't really want an auxiliary hypothesis that makes much mess. Okay, and that would really change too much within the Lambda CDM model. So we really need a kind of ad hoc hypothesis, okay, that can fix the problem and keep everything else more or less invariant. Okay, so within this kinds of set of solutions, among many more, many others, one of the solutions was the early dark energy, okay. So only dark energy is an hypothesis that comprehends a class of models, okay, in which the early expansion of the universe is modified by the introduction of a new exotic component called the only dark energy, okay? We don't really know exactly what early dark energy is, but we might suppose that more or less has the same features as dark energy, but that is different because it was active at a different point, okay, in time, okay? And this, because it must have been significant in the early universe, but now in the later universe, we don't need it, okay? We have the dark energy, okay? So what can we say about early dark energy? Well, for sure that it's physically, metaphysically spooky, okay? We don't know much about it, we don't even know whether it is exactly the same as the um, um, dark energy of the Lambda CDM model, okay? Of course, we know that it must be introduced at a different time. And we actually know that it was inserted as an ad hoc auxiliary hypothesis, okay? So now the question is how exactly the EDE would resolve the tension, okay? So a standard narrative, a standard answer would be, well, of course, because we introduced this in order to increase the expansion rate of the universe for a very brief period of time, in particularly before 100,000 years after the Big Bang, okay? And that would allow you to reinterpret the CMB data, okay? So that the Hubble constant value that we get matches the supernova data, the Schuess program data, okay? So the basic idea is to postulate this exotic fluid, okay? Only dark energy that contributes to 10% of the total energy density of the universe briefly before recombination, okay? And um, basically that, would actually sense it's localized within the first 100,000 years of the universe, then it would actually leave the late evolution of the universe unchanged, and it would lead to a higher age that matches the Schultz result, okay? However, there are two different ways in which this extra auxiliary hypothesis 
could resolve the tension, okay? So one is in a resolutively strong way, and the second one is in a moderate, weak way, okay? So we would have two kinds of success. One is really radical, say, so, okay, well, this solution would really resolve the tension. And the second is modest. And this is uh, described in this uh, article by Boulon and uh, other astrophysicists, okay? So let's uh, say how it is, okay? How these two ways uh, can be described, okay? So Boulon says, well, on the one hand, one may consider the resolving the tension involves analyzing a given model in light of a full compilation of data sets that do not include local measurements of age. Okay, and finding that the model predicts a higher value of age in statistical agreement with the shoes determination. So one way would be not to include, okay, local measurements of age, and so the shoes data, okay, the shoes results, okay. We don't include this, and then we find actually that the model predicts a higher value of age, okay. But then there is another way in which uh, this hypothesis could resolve the tension, which is uh, that, well, in this uh, way, it's uh, just uh, a good uh, fit, okay? A good uh, fit to all the data, including uh, shoes uh, data, okay? And then if uh, a model with EDE, okay, is a favored over lambda CDM model, okay? One, because it provides a better fit to all the data, including the shoes, then this is not really a resolutive or a strong way or decisive way to resolve the issue, okay? But it's a moderate, okay? It's a moderate, weaker success, okay? So Poulain, in his review of all the models of EDE achieved so far, okay? claims that EDE models, at least for the most promising ones that could resolve the tension, they actually manage to achieve the latter definition of success, but not the former, okay? Um, so the current situation with EDE, of course, may appear unsatisfactory, okay? Leading to the conclusion that most models of EDE do not really achieve uh, a great success, a conclusive success, okay? So here, of course, uh, the way Poulon set up this uh, kind of um, discussion is uh, by really building up a dichotomy between a predictive success and inclusive fit, and we discussed this yesterday, okay? Uh, Vera, yes. I have, I'm having a little trouble understanding this. So with the EDE, uh, it's like it's it's an additional matter field that you're adding on top of uh, a lambda and dark whatever dark dark matter. Yes. So at early times, this fluid is non-zero, I guess. Exactly. And it's contributing. Yeah. yeah, we will see this. Uh, yeah. Okay, you'll explain yes. this a bit more. Okay, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we will see this. Okay. Uh, and then it goes yeah. away. Yeah, but is it yes. kind of like is it is it is it kind of like in in flaton? I mean, is it is it a, is it a, a variant of a slow rolling inflation? Yeah, something like this. Yeah. Oh, there's no additional. But, oh, I see. But yeah, we yes. So we will. So yeah. So it's uh, here. Okay. So we can discuss. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um. So why exactly is it that the EDE cannot okay predict a higher value of age without including the shoes? Okay. So the problem is that the EDE models, okay, they include too many parameters. So they enlarge the parameter space with too many parameters. Most of them, actually maybe except one, okay, are not directly related to age, okay? So then uh, basically, okay, except for the total, um, the fractional contribution, okay, this FED, okay, then uh, all the parameters introduced are not strongly correlated to age, okay? So only the fractional contributions of EDE directly relates to age, okay? 
And also, the problem is that you have to constrain this fact fractional contribution. It, that, it should not be zero, as you said, okay? So it should not be zero, okay? <laughs> but the problem is that you cannot constrain, put a constraint on this, unless you insert the shoes uh, that data, okay? So only by inserting the shoes data, you could constrain the value of the fractional contributions of ED in such a way that is known as zero, okay? So if you don't put the shoes to constraint, you would have a large linear parameter space, okay? Without actually gaining a preference for higher degree of age, okay? So then, exactly, Poulon, Poulon, so who worked on EDE, and most probably he was very positive about EDE because his paper in 2019 says, well, EDE can solve the tension, okay? Now seems to be a little bit more skeptic, saying, well, there is no, no real contribution, no real so solution, okay, from EDE, okay? So as I said before, this is assuming a difference between independent prediction and inclusive fit, okay? Why is it so? Well, because if uh, ED did not include the shoes data, we would have independent predictions, okay? We would have a model that could predict, or maybe accommodation one, as we said yesterday, but it has the same, uh, provides the same degrees of confirmation as a prediction, okay? It would, in this way, it would pre predict a higher value of H that, okay, it's the same that we find with the shoes, okay? Why for inclusive fit, of course you can adjust the parameters, okay? And have, uh, you know, everything looks nicely, uh, local measurements, uh, later measurements results, or the universal measurements results and the same, okay? So then the question is, are we justified as a people working in a scientific community in really putting our efforts in EDE, okay? Are we justified in investing our resources to work on this hypothesis rather than others, okay? So one might say, well, look, as yesterday we saw, okay, the distinction between prediction and fitting accommodation is a little bit controversial, okay? So, as we said yesterday, even having a model that fit nicely, okay, better than the lambda CDM model, okay, might be a good thing, a positive thing, okay? So let's not focus on the difference between prediction and accommodation. Yes. The, the, especially with the first question you have here about are we justified in believing in EDE versus other investigating other yeah. routes? But isn't this a problem in general with cosmology? We know that Lambda CDM has some problems, but we just don't have new independent data sources such that we have enough independent measures to constrain things once we've added a new parameter to our parameter space. Isn't this just an overall going beyond Lambda CDM problem, regardless of if we use EDE or not? So, so here you're saying, well, look, you know, we know that the lambda CDM has some problems. We don't have other constraints to know which hypothesis to look, okay? Yeah. Specifically, so anything, you know, could, uh, we are justified in looking any further. Otherwise, you know, we would be staying like this and accept the lambda CDM model, okay? No, no, I'm yes. not saying that we, uh, it just feels to me like the, it, it, it hints at that we need to take all several lines of investigation seriously. Yes. Not that we should give up on any of them. Yes, necessarily. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. So you, you could say, well, we should be open to any. Okay. So as long as it's feasible and it's viable, then you know we should. So it's not really it's not a matter of yes and no that you have to so there are some groups that are investigating on some, other groups are investigating on other. Yeah. So we can discuss uh, this uh, later because okay. I, I, it's a very long story, okay. but yeah, I would just say that uh, you as an individual, okay, should choose the most promising uh, like program to, to join, okay? So with your intellectual honesty, okay, you should join the most promising program, okay? Um, if there is a program that has some inherent, inherent 
uh, intrinsic problem, okay? There are like some epistemic problem at its foundation, okay? Then maybe, you know, you should not, you should not, you are not justified in, you know, joining that program, okay? I guess, why is, why is it that we should think that ED will turn out to be, like, yeah. are there any, are there any predictions yes. that it does make that yeah, in yeah. the future could be yes. tested or? Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I will, exactly. So, I will discuss this. So, there are no, there are no reasons to say that the ED is wrong, okay? It's just that I, as I will claim later, I think that this is not the right time to investigate in ED. For now, we are not justified. And we will see why and what we first need to do. Yeah. yeah. So, in ED, this, the genus of which Lambda CDM is a species? <laughs> <laughs> yes, so with the, when the fractional contribution of early dark energy is zero, then <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. That's, a, a, that's a very nice a way to, <laughs> to regard it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. So let's, uh, for now, let's not focus on the difference between prediction and accommodation, okay? Because, you know, we we saw yesterday that the difference might not be epistemically salient, okay? My problem here is that ED models assume some experimental result, which is the shoes program, okay? And we might not be justified in believing in the shoes of program results for now, okay? So it might be that the shoes of program, so for me, as long as, you know, the EDE is assuming, okay, results for which we should have a metaphysically or epistemically positive attitude. So we are realist about this measurement result, okay? Then it's fine. It can be accommodating all kinds of data, okay? The problem is that accommodating data, okay, for which maybe we should not be realist, okay? And we will see better this now, how exactly is my thinking, okay? Indeed, we know that the third option to resolve the Hubble constant trouble, okay, is that one of the results is wrong, okay? So let's uh, have this dichotomy, even though it's not right, okay? Shoes on one hand and a flank result on the other side, okay? It could be that one of the two is wrong, okay? In particular, the shoes program, of course, okay, it's a little bit more problematic and catches our attention a bit more because the uncertainty is almost a double. And also, it involves a very sophisticated technique of building up a cosmic distance ladder, okay? So the question is, are we justified in believing in its results, okay? So of course, here we enter in the metaphysics of measurements, so there are some realist positions, anti-realist positions, coherent positions. So I don't want now to annoy you with all this, you know, literature review of all these things, okay? What they agree on is that really measurement is the hallmark of scientific enterprise. No matter whether you see it as a truth-conducing effort or endeavor, or like an instrumentalist endeavor, okay? Definitely, it's a privileged source of knowledge, okay, for those who are, um, you know, they are realists about science, okay? So we know that measurement outcomes, okay, are commonly reported as unconditional factual claims. What does it mean? Well, that they are actually normally treated as kinds of evidence, okay? for testing hypotheses, for designing and testing instruments, uh, et cetera, okay? But of course we know, and as people working in cosmology, we know that extremely well, okay? Measurement outcome is never unconditional, okay? Because of course, should be measurement claims, so should be, well, if the assumptions, uh, all the true blah, 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 if these are theoretical assumptions, 
about, I don't know, the general critical um, framework, about the instrument, about, you know, how we calculate, we, we build up the cosmic distance ladder and blah, 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 blah. The whole the two, then the outcome of would be such and such, okay? So when now we do not write or we do not consider measurement outcomes as uh, condition as uh, conditional, but we do regard them as unconditional, okay? What warrants uh, treating the epistemic status of uh, measurement outcomes as justified unconditional evidence, okay? So why is it, what warrants, okay, the, this justification, okay? So there is a metaphysical view that, however, I think is very common in cosmology and astrophysics in particular, okay, which uh, defines uh, successful measurements and claims that we should believe in successful measurements, we should, we should be realist about uh, successful measurements because they represent a fixed point, and so fixed features in the universe, okay? And the definition of uh, successful measurement uh, in, includes involves convergence and precision, of course, okay? So what is the definition of a successful measurement? It's the convergent assignment of increasingly precise values, okay? So increasingly precise values capture the notion of precision and convergence assignment captures the notions of convergence, robustness, and so on and so forth, okay? So having these kinds of measurement would be an incontrovertible evidence for fixed points in the world. There are some permanent point in the world, okay? And this, of course, finding those points to constitute an epistemic achievement, and we are justified in accepting the outcome as really unconditional claims as representing objective feature in the world, okay? So how we define a convergence? Well, a measurement practice converges when procedures apply different theoretical measurements arrive at the same outcome, okay? This is evidence that we found an objective feature of the world, okay? So this, of course, refers to the idea that we have independent different methods that approach the same result, okay? This is also linked with the concept of robustness, okay? that you know, is normally employed when a plurality of models, each making different simplifying assumptions arrived at the same result, okay? How are we going to test whether there is a convergence with this kinds of replication? So there are different categories of replication, and one of them is called the conceptual replication, which is when you test the very same hypothesis but with different methods that assume different theoretical commitments, okay? So you rely on different theoretical assumptions, okay? These kinds of replication, they normally check for systematic errors, okay? And systematic errors are those errors that they tend to bias the measurement result in the same direction. So they are very consistent, okay? And they normally affect the measurement devices or the theoretical assumptions, okay? Then the second feature, as Isa said, is a precision. A measurement is precise to the extent it returns the same result when a performer repeatedly, okay? If we have a precision, it means that we have really contained or restrained statistical random errors, okay? Which are those that affect the measurements with the scattering in the data, okay? And they normally have a different directions, okay? And then, you know, they could be managed, okay? By using statistical analysis and by averaging out the random fluctuations, okay? How we check for these errors? with direct replications, okay? Direct replications are the replications that keep everything the same. So they repeat the very same analysis or measurement procedure, okay? Using the very same methodology, okay? Except for, of course, like um, 
you know, irrelevant features of, you know, the experiment, okay? So features that do not really have any impact to, to the result, okay? So now let's go back to uh, the, the, the main topic of our talk, okay? So ED would resolve the tension with a fitting, okay? Considering the local measurements results, okay? By including the local measurements. But then are we sure about shoes, okay? We know that it's less precise, okay? So that it has more uncertainty, okay? So before being realist about the shoes result, we should check whether they are convergent, okay? So whether they are convergent, okay? So the concern is that the EDE, okay, are forcing a convergence between early universe result and the late universe result by using the late universe result, which are not convergent, okay? And so that they are deficient, they lack some, uh, um, you know, epistemic uh, justifications, okay, for us to be realistic about them, okay? So if uh, the shoes the result were be convergent, then it's okay, you know, we can include them in the fit. But if they are not convergent, then the ED models will be really epistemically troublesome, okay? So shoes, the, do the shoes results, are the shoes results are convergent, okay? Well, according to this, of course, yes, they are convergent, okay? Because they have tried in multiple ways to actually detect the systematic errors, okay? They use the better data. They increase the sample of CFITs along the years. They verified the CFITs photometry. They analyzed different, um, um, they had many different analysis on how that affects the results. The problems of protein were addressed and they had so many different, uh, okay, um, little mini runs, okay, of the measurements along all these years. And you can see that they all converge, okay? So there is convergence over the years. And so according to Rees, it cannot be, okay, that the discrepancy is due to systematic errors, okay? Because the shoes program is a very safe concerning convergence, okay? However, we also know that the shoes program is not the only program within the local universe measurements for the Hubble constant. We know that the Carnegie, Garner, Carnegie Chicago Hubble program led by Friedman, okay, is actually adopting the very same kinds of method, building up a cosmic distance ladder, okay, and that they only change the intermediate standard candles, okay, for intermediate distance, the, the standard candles for intermediate distance instead of C feet, they're the, the tip of the red giant branch, okay, stars, okay. And then they get a different result. So they, they have a result of 69, okay? So also with a very small uncertainty, okay? Does that make it better or worse? Yeah, it, it, uh, I mean, the fact that they have a different result is a bad for, uh, for I mean, 69, Sorry, I just forget yeah. the number. Does that, is that better? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Is... So 60, exactly, 67, 69, and 74, yeah. So, of course, uh, why is it that Friedman decided, okay, to run this uh, new program by replacing CFIX with, with uh, TRGB? Well, because, of course, she was concerned about the systematics of the CFIX, okay? Because this, the, the CFIX uh, involve, uh, you know, different kinds of sources of a systematic error that are very different, difficult to pin down, okay? Well, according to Friedman, the TRGB method involves uh, less uh, systematic errors to worry about because we know the physics 
of the tip of the right triumph branch very well, okay? Because we know the hallium flash phenomenon, they undergo it for which uh, they have uh, this peak brightness, okay? So the physics is uh, better understood, okay? And so we have uh, more kind of, uh, we, we are safer in considering uh, um, this method instead of the shoes method, okay? So at this point, uh, we have two experimental programs that we have been analyzing. Not they are the only one, but for now, let's grant uh, that they are these three, okay? So there is Planck, Schultz, and CCH, okay? And they all have produced discordant results, okay? So then, we also know that the only universal Planck method is a pretty much independent of the late universal cosmic distance letter. Of course, they all hold uh, uh, the lambda CDM model true, okay? So, um, and then uh, we have a shoes and a CCH that partially differ, okay, in their use of intermediate distance standard candles, but overall they agree. Okay, so we can see that there is a spectrum of uh, conceptual applications here. Okay, so we have Planck, Schultz, and CCH. They are all conceptual applications. They all utilize the different methods. Okay, they all check for convergence. Okay, then Schultz and CCH have overlaps in methods. So they change the samples. Okay, you may say, well, you know, samples are not really important, okay? But well, no, of course I hear they are important because uh, they involve also changing the systematics and biases, okay? So they all, yeah, they still check for convergence. And you're thinking of these as applications as determining age not value? Exactly, yes. Okay. But so, given that they're using different assumptions, one probing early and the rest probing late universe, can you really say that they're, Probably yeah. The, the yeah. Same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, thank you for this uh, question. So, of course, um, the very kind of naive definition of conceptual application is that the main hypothesis, okay, is uh, the same, or, you know, the, the, so you want to test the same thing, okay? So, in this case, it's the value of H, okay? But then uh, this involves, uh, okay, changing uh, theoretical assumptions within uh, conceptual applications. But this is something that conceptual applications allow you to do, okay? So, of course, you might say, well, look, actually the hypotheses are changing because we're not just uh, testing one hypothesis, we're testing a family of hypotheses. And then uh, within this family, we have so many different uh, things uh, going on for early universe measurements and late universe measurement. But then uh, it's actually always like this, you know, whenever like I wanted to measure, I don't know, the temperature of my body, okay, with uh, a mercury thermometer or with uh, a like um, digital thermometer, the theoretical assumptions are very different. And yet, you still have a conceptual applications. So here you, maybe you are a bit more concerned that these are applications because you can really feel, you know, the weight of all those <laughs> theoretical that are very problematic. But in reality, you always have a change of hypothesis, of a set of hypotheses when you do conceptual applications. And you still have conceptual applications. Yeah, thanks, yeah. So, okay, so they all still check for convergence, okay? So because of the high degree of independence of the Planck and Schultz experiment, okay, one, okay, is allowed to infer only that there might be some systematic errors, okay? So because of the Schultz and the Planck are so different, okay, if there is discordance of a result, okay, one might just say, well, look, I know that there is some systematic errors. I don't know where, okay, I just don't know that, of course, holding true that, you know, lambda CDM model is fine and everything is okay. 
But if we do the CCH and we, so we have a choose and we do the CCH, then this conceptual replication is much more useful because it can offer some more precise information of where the discordance is and what is the source of the systematic errors, okay? This is because they share the same systematics. And uh, so the CCH was built with the hypothesis that the source of error was in the C feed photometry. Okay, so the CCH, suppose that it gets the same result as a shoe, so then it would say, well, there was no problem with the C feed photometry. Okay? So, of course, the TLGB method evolves a systematic tool, okay? And we have to be careful about this, okay? So, if a shoes and CCH results have been strongly convergent, uh, Okay, as I said before, then it means that there was no problem with the systematic errors of C feeds. Okay, it would have maybe be something tied with the early universe method, okay, or with the physics of the cosmological model. So we would have been justified in saying, well, maybe there is something wrong with the lambda C. Maybe there is wrong. But since uh, there is divergence, okay, and they are holding true the lambda CDM model, there must be a problem here. Okay, so then this means that no one is currently in the position to argue that the result for the Hubble constant is correct and the others are mistaken. Okay, there is no clear evidence that one team or another is to blame for the discordance. Okay, and what we have to do is just keeping checking for errors. Okay. So this means also that we cannot be realists of shoes, okay? We don't have any justifications for being realist of shoes. And so EDE is not epistemically justified. Yes. So, um, but uh, EDE presumably can, okay, let's say we don't trust, uh, we, we may not be realist of shoes, yeah. but of CCH, let's say, yeah. or something else. Uh, there is, let's assume that there is still a gap between, mm -hmm. I mean, after you do all the convergence yeah. and everything, there's a gap between early universe and late universe. ED could still resolve whatever that gap is, right? You could fit it such that it reduces yeah. that gap. Yeah. So it doesn't really require shoes. Uh, I mean, it, it doesn't require that currently we only have shoes and therefore relying on shoes mm -hmm. to justify ED, it, it does not break ED really. Is that is that right? Or Yes. So, well, I think, yes. So, um, it's not really a problem of introducing dark energy here. It's a problem of the method of the models. So, you're right. Yeah. Okay. So, it's not that I'm against uh, introducing only dark energy. Okay. I'm... Uh, against uh, being uh, too much in a hurry and uh, take the shoes uh, as uh, the... So yes, I think that you made a very, very um, yeah, uh, valid point. So actually here, you know, so yeah, my point is that we have to wait until we get the convergent result and then we can do the ED. okay? But for now, my, my, my thought is that we should not invest in EDE because we still don't have the convergent results. And maybe once we get the convergent result, it's the same as the CMB, okay? But then your point is probably say, well, you know, suppose that there is still the divergence, okay? Then EDE, that there is a divergence between early and late, but that late is a convergence. Then it would be a problem uh, for ED, I mean, is there still a problem for ED? No. Yeah. Yes, you are totally right. So we are basically uh, looking at the things at the different angles. Yeah. yeah. So another thing, like, uh, so you mentioned that with the late universe, uh, you can try various other things, like switch out C feeds for TRGB and some other things as well. Uh, what would be the way to do conceptual replications for the early universe? Would it be another telescope that looks at the same kind of data with 
I don't know the better place. Yeah, exactly. Like, what what would be the way to do it? Yeah, so it, it it seems to me that the best way to go would be really to have a different uh, programs with rely on different telescopes and different uh, maybe measurement techniques. I mean, I, now I cannot really imagine like mm -hmm. what that could be. Okay, but yes. Definitely. I mean, with a much more precision, I mean, already 1% is really good, yeah. but yeah, I mean, it seems also that, you know, it's uh, like Planck, uh, the Planck program already gave us like the maximum we could get. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm happy, you know, if they can further progress <laughs> in this sense. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good. So, so uh, sorry, I yes. have one more question. Yeah, sure. So, um, with Planck, yeah. uh, you measure something and then you uh, use lambda CDM to, to predict what the current exactly. H naught value is, right? Yeah, from the CMB, you right. you use uh, the lambda CDM model to infer, to constrain. Right. So in this, if you were to say that it's not lambda CDM, uh, you get a measurement for H naught from... Um, uh, from say a late universe, but from the early universe, you have to change your model, and uh, the and presumably if you want to change from uh, lambda CDM, you have some other uh, model which uh, will have some additional parameters or whatever. If you don't get that model right, your uh, your ability to just match the late time H naught would be probably very easy. So is that is it conceptually yes. the same as uh, like yeah? I, I'm not I'm not exactly yeah. Here. Uh, understanding how easy it would be to, you know, put the burden on the theory. I see. Yeah. I think this is what I was saying earlier. I think mm -hmm. that the answer is it's hard until you get a third right, independent right. Mm -hmm. thing to do constraining such that you can assume, you can feed in two and pop out the third without having to have known the third. Absolutely. I think mm -hmm. that's what I was saying about all cosmology suffering from this yeah. the problem yeah. that go beyond lambda CDM yeah. with the state of the observables we have today. Yeah. So my so only like point... mid, mid <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so my only point is now about uh like your attitude towards these measurement results. Mm -hmm. So as long as they are precise and they have convergence, for me it's fine. But if you see that there are some troubles, then wait, don't include them, you know, in your fitting. So that's that's my point. I don't know if it makes sense. If it still makes sense, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I I understand the point of being careful to include them in your fitting, or at least mm -hmm. to be make sure you're being very intellectually honest, saying yeah. that this is a fitting choice I made. Mm -hmm. But given the state that we don't have a a more independent, uh, a third independent mm -hmm. measurement, yeah. and but still just thinking about the history of things. It feels like this could also tell people to be too cautious and say there's mm -hmm. no point in exploring other models until we know if there's truly attention. Yeah. But I feel like history has shown us, especially if you think about like high energy theory, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, that waiting that that even if a lot of theories will die mm -hmm. once the results come out later, in having stretched ourselves to come up with a landscape, mm. one of the models in our landscape may be something we come back to later once we have data i think about mm -hmm. for instance yeah um um with the with the lhc uh the higgs right yes. like that was so many decades but it was part of a whole landscape of theories that had been developed knowing that there was something there but not knowing if it would continue or data would cut it down but eventually you know data got decades later and i feel like yes. there's also the it, i feel like how do you be intellectually honest without discouraging people from developing yes. a landscape. Yeah. So, yes. So that's definitely something that we should extremely, that I think applies very well in cases where we have very scarce data. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and there is uh, this uh, whole theoretical machinery and just very little data. And then, you know, you say, well, of course, I don't have much data to actually support this theoretical framework, but this is what we have and we should continue. So I totally agree with this. I think that here we are in a different kinds of situation because 
as I was saying now, I mean, there is still so much of things that we can do, mm -hmm. okay? There is the CCH program, there are so many different programs. There is clearly a program, a problem also for the late uh, universe measurements. So in a way, they would agree, okay? And there are things that we can do now, right now, okay? So this is a more way to like a push or an invitation, of course, I'm not, <laughs> I don't want to, but like an invitation to direct uh, the attention and the energy of the scientific community where it's one way instead of another that it seems so more fruitful because in any case we want to have very good late universal measurements okay that are you know safe but that they are robust that so yeah so that's so this i think is the uh almost the penultimate slide or something like that so Basically, for me, to me, ED is problematic for the following re reason, that they are trying to force convergence between two different measurements results, taking as granted a, a result that is not convergent, okay? So to me, first achieve a local convergence and then build up, you can also force a global convergence, okay? Then how we can achieve a local convergence, okay? So we know that most probably a problem is systematic errors, okay? Um, and the, the problem is that there are unknown, okay, systematic errors, okay? How we can, actually I was not the penultimate slide. <laughs> So how we can uh, ferret out unknown, um, you know, um, systematic errors? Well, you know, you can uh, transform unknown systematic errors into known systematic errors, okay, by building up different methods to test with the same hypothesis, so different conceptual replications, okay, and then once you know them, okay, then you can eliminate their influence or you can remove them, okay, or put a bounce on them, okay, include them as residual systematic errors, okay? And in this way, this unknown, they become known, okay? Known systematic errors, okay? But then of course they are the unknown that remains unknown. Okay, of course, as always, okay. So then uh, the reason of the discrepancy can be one of the following, okay. So one of the experiments underestimates its random error because of course we also have the possibility of random errors, okay. One of the experiments underestimates its known errors, one um, has not accounted for unknown systematic errors and probably we are in this one. So the challenge is that we transform this unknown into knowns through conceptual replications. Of course, there could be always some unknowns, okay? Okay, so some conclusion. So um, I wanted to discuss the intrinsic relation between how science progresses the methodology of science what hypothesis we formulate, which one we choose to test, okay? And uh, with uh, the, the relation between this and uh, our metaphysical position towards a measurement and the epistemic justifications we have to endorse a metaphysical position or the other, okay? So we thought the fixed point realism says something that most probably for cosmologists and astrophysics is very, well, much, uh, you know, applied in science. We have to test for convergence and precision. At this point, the EDE solutions uh, is a little bit problematic because they are trying to resolve the tension by forcing convergence between early universe measurements and late universe measurements, which, however, are not convergent, okay? So I think that the methodology here is wrong, okay? First, you should get local convergence for conceptual application, and then you can force the global one. And this, of course, requires a step-by-step -step process. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, I know we're out of yeah, time, but let's, yes. if you are available, yeah. let's sure. Um, and... the question on the systematics, I mean, there, there's systematics that will push it in one direction or another, and then there's systematics that just might increase the error bar, right? 
So those are two very different situations. Mm. One one shifting a mean and one shifting mm. spread. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah, I did not consider this. I was just considering systematic errors that are pushing in uh, one uh, direction. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Mm. Yes, thanks. Um, on the slide where you listed out the various options near the end um, in terms of like systematic errors or what yeah. have to, I take it that the ED people would say, but generally people would say, if it turns out that you're measuring two different things, mm -hmm. that's none of these options, yeah. right? So it's not a systematic error, it's an error in thinking that you're measuring the same thing, which is H0, and you think that it's going to be consistent over time. But actually, it turns out like early and late. Yeah, it's not will be different. So, yeah, exactly. I guess so. It's here. I meant reason for discrepancy be between a CCH and shoes. Oh, I see. yeah, okay. but yes, definitely. So the yes, definitely. So the or the EDE people would say this is uh, a false. I mean, this uh, is not the entire picture. Okay, right. Because um, actually, one uh, so. I mean, I think that the ED people would still say, well, if you get two discordant uh, measurements for the late universe, well, you have a problem, okay? It can right. be one of these uh, three, okay? But then uh, they would say, well, you know, in any case, whatever is, uh, yes, the, the measurement, uh, still, if it's still, if it's still discordant um, and different from uh, the early universe, uh, then uh, you know it's a clear sign that the lambda CDM model is uh, false mm -hmm. and then it's to modify it. And I would, you know, once we have a convergence uh, here, then uh, you know I would be happy to inquire into uh, auxiliary assumptions uh, for the lambda CDM or even like we should discard this uh, lambda CDM model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I'm just thinking like another bullet that says I see theoretical. Issues um, <laughs> yes, would yeah. be really because that would, I mean, I think that would make yeah. sense for what Dylan was saying. Is like, yeah, you don't have further ways of testing for systematics right now, and so you can just explore mm -hmm. these theoretical options in the meantime. Yeah, so I'll sacrifice, yes, and, you know, mm -hmm. the time of cosmologists. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I can imagine also that you fold those into what you call your own systematic errors if you assume the framework by which you're going to infer values as part of the exactly. experiment itself, then it's, you're saying, you know, you have a systematic bias in your method of measurement because you're including your theory under which you'll make the inferences of values as part of the experiment itself. Mm -hmm. So I could imagine rolling that yeah. into two in a way. So maybe well. you were thinking more about something like, well, lambda CDM is completely correct. And then uh, we might uh, have uh, a model that says that we should get two different uh, measurements with, I don't know, CPs uh, mm -hmm. and uh, TLGP. Mm -hmm. In that way, then we should need uh, another bullet. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, uh, yes, it's uh, all in the systematics. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that is wrong. I'm just <laughs> saying I can imagine yeah. what arguing for it as yes. this type of systematic error. Like when you measure something under Newtonian, assumptions, you know, you're baking in some systematic mm -hmm. error by assuming that Newtonian is sort of general relativity, which may or may not be relevant mm -hmm. on your energy scale. Mm -hmm. 